the order that we will utilize them. Um, our guests, here are some topics. Here, did you get one of these? Uh, no, thank you. And those are located on the second page of your packet. So they're those pausing, paraphrasing, posing questions, putting ideas on the table, providing data, paying attention to self and others, and presuming positive intentions. So if you take a look at those, read through those again, and then I'm going to ask you to write for three minutes. Um, you can use the post-it notes on your table. There's pens out here if you need to. There's your hand, you don't have to do this. Um, think about an area that you feel is a strength for you. Do you want to do that? Yeah, I've got my, do you have any pens? Oh, is that a pen? Yeah, I don't know. Do you guys need pens? Yes. You have a pen, Andy? Uh, yes. Okay. 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 <laughs> yeah. Um, so if you'll identify an area that you feel is a strength and then identify an area that you would like to grow. And for tonight's meeting, keep one of those in mind um, as we move forward and why you want to focus on those. So for example, maybe I'm really good at paraphrasing what people say but I really need to work on pausing because I don't wait for the other person to respond. I start um, talking over them. <laughs> so maybe that's an area I wanna work on tonight. So just look through those, think about which one um, you connect with the most and, um, and what you would like to focus on. So at this time, um, if Barbara, if you want to move closer to Sylvia, real oh quick, sure, because yes. I know that's fine. You're going to turn to an elbow partner, and each of you take a minute to share with each other what your focus is for tonight and your reason. And you can go ahead and participate if you'd like, and if you could want to participate. Yeah. And I should have your last 
before finish up the last letter. So it's just an any, any, what is your strength and what is something that you want to do to heal it. All right. Okay. So thank you guys for sharing with each other. Um, I won't invade your privacy by asking you to share with, with me what you're working on. Uh, I'm going to be working on, thanks. I'm gonna be paying attention to self and others so that I'm making sure that everyone has equity of voice. Just wanna re, um, revisit our working agreements. These are just how we'll conduct business. You can stay over here because I don't think. Uh, yeah. yeah, I just moved them. Um, we want to begin and end on time. We got started a little late because of the rain. That's okay, but we'll have you out of here by seven. We want to demonstrate um, respect for one another, being attentive whenever someone else is speaking. Um, keep our comments and questions focused to the topic at hand or on hand, whichever one you like. Um, provide opportunity for everyone to participate and silence our phones. Um, and avoid side conversations. We're a small enough group where it's not too disruptive, but um, make sure your phones are on the side of your bike range. Okay. Um, we also always set up the parking lot for questions. If you have ideas that come to mind, we revisit that at the end when we go to our closure so that we make sure that your, that your questions and comments are addressed. Um, this is a very uh, important opportunity for you to provide input for our district and for our English learner programs. So we don't want to miss any question or comment. So making sure you're putting those pens <coughs> in there helps us to make sure that we are addressing concerns, okay? For comments. Yeah? Okay. okay. <laughs> All right. So normally we would have our president call the meeting to order. We were not able to elect the president because we didn't have quorum last time. Um, did we have call in this time? No, <laughs> definitely not. So I'll go ahead and call the meeting to order at 5.48 p.m. as reflected, which will be reflected in the minutes. And we'll do a roll call of the representatives. Okay. Um, I know who's here and who's not. We don't really. Yeah, it's fine. Yeah, okay. Okay. Um, <laughs> So we have, we have uh, a lot of people, not a lot. Any changes or additions to the agenda? So go ahead and look through the agenda and then we'll discuss any changes or additions that need to be made. And there's some reordering that I would like to make, but we'll um, wait until we have a motion on the table before we reach a session. Is there a motion to approve the? I move to approve the minutes. Is there a second? A second. Or the agenda, sorry. The agenda. Did you second that? Okay. Okay. Yeah. So Ms. Alina um, <laughs> makes a motion. Ms. D seconds that motion. That motion. That motion. Um, discussion. Is there any discussion other than what I'm going to make? So I just want to move. Um, because I put this in the wrong order. We, um, I'd like to move the appointing the chairpersons to unfinished business rather than um, new business. And we will actually have to table it anyway because we don't have quorum. Okay. Do you need that to be moved? So, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So moved. <laughs> I'll second the movement. Okay. All those in favor? Oh, I'm sorry, and the other thing, we I didn't have the minutes to review the minutes in here. And the order. That's okay. So I added minutes oh, okay. under like right up before public comments. So that was the other change. Sorry guys, I'm not doing a great job. <laughs> so um, I wanted to make two changes to the adopted agenda. So one of those being to move the appointment of chairpersons, et cetera, to um, the unfinished business, and the second being to add 
the review and approval of minutes from last meeting to um, item five, which pushes everything down. Okay, so. Read so that again. So, so moved. I read you such movement. <laughs> All those in favor. Aye. Aye. So our next order of business would be report from our ELAC representatives from each site, um, starting with Alan. So did you have a report for what happened at your last ELAC meeting? Or did it hit Arnie with that? I think it hit the report. Okay. She didn't. She didn't. Okay. Belair, would you like to share yeah, from there? Carmen wasn't able to attend, but as the facilitator of the meeting, um, our last um, ELAC meeting really focused on the importance of school attendance. Um, they reviewed a short video on how even just tardies and, and days missed can build up and how it makes not only students feel, but how it can impact their academic achievement. Um, we also had uh, parents see a, a video clip on the process of LCAP and um, what that meant because beginning in February they'll be taking that annually and it also explained the initial assessments for language learners. And a great discussion came up about why some students were taking the test and why some students weren't. And we talked about how the language survey upon registering triggers whether or not a student is tested um, in LCAP or if they're a little bit older, I'm sorry, mm -hmm. in um, self, the new yeah, self. Older, uh -huh. older folks. Um, and then we just, um, moved to, for, for some membership and we had a follow-up meeting and, a, and elected um, a president and a secretary. Awesome, thank you. Um, John Muir, do you have, or there's been no news from John Muir? Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm sorry, Lacey. Uh, we that. haven't had our school say council yet to report back with the with ELAC. ELAC. Okay, okay. And Portola, we don't have representation tonight. Did you attend the last ELAC? No. No, okay. It's the first time for me, so. Perfect, okay. <laughs> um, Parkside, Parkside, Barbara, do you want to share off the yeah, Sure. Um, well, I forget the date. It was um, uh, maybe the week before um, we had winter break when mm -hmm. we had our meeting. And uh, Monina had, again, the similar information about ELAC and those changes. And then we also discussed the REFAC classification. We only, I think, had one parent come, though. We need to get more parents yeah. to come and a student came, which was lovely. That's and then we had the translator there to translate for the parents, and, um, and myself and Monina. And, um, but it was a, a, you know, maybe a 30 minute meeting, but um, Monina is very good about keeping everything right on task, you know, mm -hmm. moving us through. And um, understanding the points of reclassification, especially has been a little bit of an issue at Parkside, having everyone understand these changes. And then we also talked about the upcoming with the ELAC changes, the training that we have coming up, mm -hmm. and things like that. And the parent who was there was um, very, I think, happy to be there and get the information. And in the meantime, we still share it with parents at conferences, for example. Perfect. Okay. Thank you for sharing me out. Okay. So um, our next order of business is to review the minutes from the last meeting. Minutes are just a recorded record of the notes taken at the last meeting. So if you would, go ahead and review those. Those are in your packet. <coughs> Normally the secretary reads those aloud. Oh, all of them? They're in English and in Spanish as well. Oh, okay, I see. <laughs> well, that's why there's so many pages. Do you want us just to read through, or do you want me to read them? Pretend I'm the secretary? Would you, yeah, That'd be great. Would you yes, like to read through that? But I, I can't do the Spanish part. Who wants to do that part? Um, Carrie's uh, is interpreting for. I think Carmen is the only one. Yeah. Okay. So and then she's okay. 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 The lady behind you also. Yeah. She's Spanish. Yeah. Okay. Yes. How about the woman in the back? Yes. I don't know. The parents. So so parent. Anyone else need Spanish interpretation? Do you? Yes. Necesita okay. 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 So she can listen at this. Or come up and follow. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so. Puede um, uh, um, sí. yeah, okay. okay. So we had a 
call to order at 531 and uh, by um, Dr. Rogers for a grounding activity. Committee members shared what they see as their role in DLAC and what they can contribute and what they would like out of their experience in this committee, DLAC, this year. Responses included parents seeing their role as a voice for their children and teachers seeing their role as being there to listen to parents and bring back what they learned to their colleagues. Would you like a simultaneous translation? Or Carmen, le gustaría um, escuchar a los minutos or usted puede leer solita en español? Or She'll read it. Okay. Okay, so okay, just read it. And the parent behind, is she okay? Yes, does she, she want to come up and see? Okay. 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 All right. So then we have the roll call of representatives and then changes or additions to the agenda. At 5.47 p.m., the agenda was reviewed. No changes or additions were made. Ms. D's motion to adopt the agenda. Ms. Amina seconded. The motion was carried. Reports from ELAC representatives. At 5.50 p.m., ELAC representatives shared their reports. Bel Air, the first official ELAC, will be at the end of this month after the principal call. Parkside, last Thursday, representatives from San Mateo High School District gave a presentation. There was English and Spanish translation throughout the meeting. Students and parents attended with parent liaisons helping with child care. The presentation let students know important dates and helped establish parent ELAC membership. No other schools gave reports. And then, under public comments, there were none. Unfinished business, none. New business at 6.15 p.m., Dr. Rogers motion to appoint chairperson, vice chairperson, secretary, and parliamentarian. The motion was not carried as not enough parents were in attendance to appoint all positions. Motion was tabled for the following meeting. At 6.18 p.m., Committee members reviewed and amended the proposed bylaws. Committee members noticed, or excuse me, noted grammatical and spelling errors and discussed creating flexibility in member term limits. At 6 p.m., Dr. Sheila, is it Kratz? Yes. Kratz made a motion to accept the amended bylaws. Ms. Carrie D. seconded the motion passed. At 6.30 p.m., committee members reviewed the 2017 to 18 annual parent survey and suggested edits and changes for this year's survey. Members also suggested ways to increase parent input and engagement. Suggestions included offering incentives for returning surveys, having surveys translated into multiple languages, and having surveys available at parent events such as parent conferences, Principal coffee and winter performances. And then at item eight, announcements at 6:55 p.m. Ms. Arena shared some of the resources and programs Parkside is using for their English language development classes. And then item nine, adjournment closure at 6:59 p.m. Dr. Kratz motion to adjourn. Ms. Dido, Dido, how do you say? Dido. Dido seconded. The motion passed. And that's is that it. There a motion to, to approve. I saw my name one more time, so I want to give someone else a chance. <laughs> I need a motion to. I have motion to approve the minutes. Okay. Ms. Chaucer, a motion to approve the minutes. Anyone? I'll second if no one else does. Okay. okay. <laughs> Ms. Sabina uh, makes a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Unfinished business. We had um, put on here our motion uh, to vote our, our nominations and our voting. Unfortunately, we don't have quorum. Please, please, please recruit parents to um, to take on some spots and be here. I know there was some confusion about tonight's meeting, and, and I apologize if there was any confusion. Um, 
please make sure uh, that you're coming to all of them. If you can't come, you can always send someone in your place, like, like Ms. Hosgrove did with Sylvia. To... Okay, so that motion, or uh, that act, that agenda item needs to be tabled for um, the next meeting. Okay, going on to new business. Okay, so we had, <laughs> I applied for groups of four, but there are um, only six folks present. So if you guys would all, would, would you guys just join together? Would that be okay? Um, or there's five, five. Are you taking over as the parent no, representative? I'm the parent, from just the parent. Then. Right, because we didn't have a parent rep from Lillingwood. Were you, did Miss Hennessy ask you to be the parent rep? Yes. Oh, okay, great. So you are a voting member. <laughs> awesome, thank you for being here. Okay, so do you guys want to join at one table? And then we're going to, sure, which table? Oh, which table? This table. <laughs> Carrie's <laughs> table. Come on over. <laughs> no, Does no, everyone I, come there? share out in a succinct manner and loud enough for everyone to hear at the end, okay? Um, so, Carrie's volunteer to be the note keeper. Is there some, you're looking at your watch to be I the time, be time keeper. keeper. Barbara will be the time keeper. Some questions. If you're not comfortable, I'm happy to facilitate. <laughs> Is there... Lacey, would you be willing to share? I can. I'm not the sound as wonderful. Oh, yeah, you have a beautiful voice now. <laughs> okay, so we'll have. Hi. Hi. Are you here? Have heard that you left? Oh, wonderful. Come on in. Go ahead and sign in. We have child care. Oh, where um, is it? In, it's just back here, but if you want to grab the <coughs> first, or could you? Or do you want to do that? Right. Okay. We have one more number. Yay. Okay. So we have we have our our roles that we're going to to um, to utilize when we're going through. Um, we'll have an activity. I'm going to share information, and then you're going to have an opportunity to discuss. Um, this is a way that we can get as much information and much as much input from families to make our English learner programs and services stronger as as we grow as a district. Okay. So. Um, what I wanted to start with, oh, I didn't do a good job on the transitions, is the process mm -hmm. for, oops, Ellen? Ellen? Oh, okay. Are you Sandra? Sima. Sima, okay. She's a parent. I didn't have it time for you. Okay. <coughs> I already know as a guest. Go ahead and sign you in, and then we are welcome to grab an agenda and have a seat. Okay. So one thing, and I know, um, Ms. Dees and Ms. Urbana have talked about this a little bit, is that some of our parents aren't aware of how their child is identified as an English learner. And so I really want to make sure that we're clear on that because our families are looking to us to provide that information. Um, so I wanted to go through, how does your child be, uh, become identified as an English learner? And so the first step is that whenever parents enroll at the, um, at the school site, the first time that they enroll in schools in California, they complete a document called the Home Language Survey. Okay, so the first time that you enroll, you complete that document. It asks you four questions. It asks you 
What was the first language your child spoke um, when they began talking? What language does your child communicate to you most? What language does your um, do you communicate to your child the most? And the final question is, what is the language that's used most at home? So they're all kind of different questions about the communication between parents and the child. If any one of those questions is answered with a different language, then that tells us, okay, we need to check to make sure that this kid's able to access uh, materials, access the curriculum with, without support. So what that triggers is, um, the, this is like a random term, we always say the ELAS, most people don't know what the heck we're talking about, but the English language acquisition status, so this tells us whether the child, the child is English only, whether they're English learner, or whether they're fluent. Um, when we first see that one or more areas is identified as a different language other than English, we enter TBD, or to be determined, okay? We have 30 days after that date of enrollment. By law, we're required to assess your child within 30 days to determine whether or not they need to be assessed um, for to, as an English learner. Can we break down your Any student who has that TBD status has to take the LPAC initial. Now, I know Ms. D said before, in the past they used to take the CELT, and the CELT was one time per year. The LPAC is different. There's the initial exam that's taken whenever the child enrolls for the first time in California, and then there's the LPAC summative, which is given at the middle of the year, okay? When a child's first enrolled, they take the LPAC initial. They only ever take the LPAC initial one time. The LPAC initial has only three levels. It has novice and moderately developed and IFEP. IFEP stands for initially fluent in English. So this means that, hey, we tested this kid and we know that he or she are, is able to communicate in English with the same fluency level as a student who's a, um, a native language speaker, an English speaker, okay? If the student scores a one or a two, either that's, that's the novice or the moderately developed, then students qualify to receive ELD services. We are required by law, by law and board policy, to provide them with ELD services until they become reclassified which means that they're able to participate in the district's educational programs without language acquisition support, okay? Um, I put a little website link on the bottom for you um, if you wanted to look at the levels for that initial exam and get some more information about how those are determined. Are, okay. At this time, we'll engage in a conversation we don't have groups of four, we have one group. Um, and so in this discussion, we want to record ideas about what this process confirms about information you already know, what surprises you, and what are some ideas that you have for making this process more clear to families when they enroll and in those following 30 days. Okay, so. Should I use a, a There's a question mark. <coughs> question is just about the calendar. Is it school days or calendar days? I mean, school so, days. Okay, so 30, so that would be six weeks. About, yeah, right, it's about, about six, six weeks. weeks. Okay. And, what, and so you can't go past that, basically. Uh, if, you you do, do, it's just, if you get sanctioned. <laughs> it's, right. um, it's not a good idea because we want to provide children, like even though you can go past those 30 days, we're required by legal obligation to do it within those 30 days, and like it's a moral obligation, at least for me as an educator, to make sure that I'm providing students with the services they need as soon as possible. Yes. So when they do the test for them every year, or just on the beginning when they got that's the that's a great question. So the initial assessment is only given one time. Oh, okay. Then they take the summative assessment every year until oh. they're reclassified. 
So when they reach the level of English, they're going to start doing that? Yes. Because my son is second language, he's Arabic, and I keep receiving that from the district. Okay. So We're going to go through the reclassification yeah. process tonight, oh, okay. too, because I'm finding out that a lot of people don't know what their children need to, to do and to attain in order to become reclassified. Okay? Mm -hmm. So in our group, what information that I just shared with you did you already know? And we can just share it? Yeah, we're just sharing it because we're... Okay, so I just wanted to pop out that I okay. thought it was in the first like um, two months of school or something, or within the first two months, so having it clarified in the first um, 30 days is good. The assessment? You thought uh -huh. the assessment was just... Right, that in. initial um, assessment and... Um, exactly. Um, Carmen shared that she did know about the initial test. She knew, she knows about the, the LPAC exam. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. I think most people do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the, like, I have a kind of a question about the summative mid-year. Is there still just one test a year after the initial? Or is there a summative mid-year and then another test at the end of the year? It's just a summative. Just that's still given. one a year, but it's in the middle of the year. Yeah, it's February. Okay. So we all confirm still? Yeah, what did this confirm about? Um, what surprised you? Yeah. What can, what is the, okay. is there anything else that this, um, that this last slide confirmed for you about things you already knew? The home language survey. You knew about the home language survey? Okay. What surprised you about this process? Is there anything? So I didn't know that it's going to take like four or five years for each child to be reclassified. And um, I didn't know how would that will affect them in middle school and high school Great. if they continue to be um, um, an English, English learner. learner yeah. OK, that's great. And we'll be talking more about that reclassification, too. Mm -hmm. Is there any other surprises? that you had or ahas? I know it, um, some people had already shared that they didn't realize it was just only 30 days. And I know this year, I know that that was a surprise because the people who every year have done the testing, our retirees, were not aware that they were supposed to do it within the first 30 days. I think what's surprising me is that there's a lot um, more that is being considered in the reclassification process. I don't know if we haven't mentioned When we go yet, to the reclassification, there's, yeah. Yeah, there's a lot more okay. that, uh, to make sure we're really sure that they can function. Perfect. OK, what are some ideas that you have? And this is where I really want to hear from our parents for making this more clear to parents at the beginning when they first enroll. What would you like to see to help you understand the process of um, being identified as an English learner. And I'll just share that um, parents have frequently shared with me when state test, when the testing comes about, because it's the letter comes from my office, and I've had parents call me and say, I didn't know when I wrote on the home language survey, when I wrote like, hey, we speak Tagalog at mm -hmm. home, they didn't know that that meant their child would have to be assessed, even though and this, this happens frequently, that they did not understand <coughs> the implications of that, that their child does mostly speak English, but they do also know Tagalog or Portuguese or Spanish or Vietnamese or whatever language. So that's really important to me at the district level that our parents are aware. So I want some of your ideas um, for how that could be better communicated. But the, the, <coughs> the paperwork process can be overwhelming. Mm -hmm. So whether people kind of chunk it up, they do it as they can. But make, the home language survey is a standalone. Mm -hmm. And so you just think, I'm going to answer this question because the district wants the information. Maybe if either a cover sheet of that or a preface of the home language survey this, you know, the, the information that you give us during this 
this home language survey will result in blah, 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 with fancy words. I don't know, because yes. from what I, I see, and what I, the home language, and this is not San Bruno, everywhere it's the same home language survey that just says, you better help us understand your family's language needs. Please fill out the survey. It doesn't say, if you do this, this will happen. If you do this, this won't happen. Yeah, because in the, the fancy words that it does say in ours, because we were just reviewing our enrollment documents because they were <coughs> yesterday for kindergarten and TK, it says um, for us to determine your child's primary language and provide appropriate supports. But we don't want to, I'm afraid saying too much. Yeah. If you give too many facts saying, then this will happen, the parents that believe their child is knows more English than they really do, then they're going to, in a sense, lie. And then it's more of a struggle in the classroom because we do know that they right. need the help, but they didn't tell the truth on the survey because now we gave too much information that overwhelmed them of, well, I don't want them having another test, so right. no. Okay. So it's finding a way, as opposed to a cover sheet, is a way maybe at kindergarten registration when we do our roundups, mm -hmm. in a sense, put it out at that time because we're already welcoming them and we're making it a warm environment for them to feel safe that discussing it that way and really emphasizing how important it is to tell the truth so we really can help their child. Does that occur before enrollment or after? So it, it varies school site by school site. I mean, Rollingwood we did, when did we do Rollingwoods? So maybe- And John Muir we did. I mean, I don't think well, that they're always the same to notify the parents to come is because they've enrolled for kindergarten. Yeah. Yeah, so you they enroll I mean? and then we look on our list and we send it out. Yeah, because I think it's around, we did it March. So when they come to enroll <laughs> at the school, uh, one thing that, um, in my previous experience when I was a principal, I had a parent liaison at my school site who was bilingual and they would sit with the parents and go through um, some of the forms. But we don't get the forms until school starts. No, um, no, the enrollment forms were made available today. No, I know, but what oh, I'm oh. saying, like all the actual forms that get turned After in. After they're completed. Yeah. Right, and so they've already completed the home language survey by then. Could so. we send, is there a way we send it home again with our back to school packets? Um, or we're putting it in because the if they answer something different. Well, yeah, because then we need it within the thirty one, days. One that they filled out. Yeah. yeah, and we need it within thirty days, anyways. And yeah. who and knows if they'll get them in within thirty days? So I think maybe there needs to be like better explanation, um, in that it's handed out separately from that whole like Dr. Dr. D's Dr. D's ten and D's um, that when they're enrolling. Because not every kid gets that when they enroll, only if it's their first time coming to California schools, which is usually your kindergartners and your TK <laughs> students. But sometimes you get a fifth grader who just moved here from Brazil or just moved here from Florida even. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, it's their first time in California schools that they get that. So maybe just handing that separately when we give out the packet <coughs> and saying, this form helps us identify the services that your child will need to support their language development. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, no, that sounds very clear. We have a number of students who come to maybe first time in this country coming into Parkside. Yeah, yeah. There's a there's a handful of kids who who like district wide that have just entered the country. Yes, it says, uh, it says the English language the student lower than the others. He gonna have a special program, or is it what? How they gonna improve his language? Okay, so you uh, have questions about how the, the process, mm -hmm. and that leads us right into my next slide. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, um, so do we want to report this out, or I think since we're all talking at once, is, that is there okay? anything then, if I may, that 
we've missed or you want to add um, just glancing at this or maybe I I didn't paraphrase the right way help me with that um, quicker glance. In, in, yeah in the process it just has to be really certain right so what part of this needs clarification <coughs> on the home language survey it just needs to be certain that I don't know if it's so the, no, the, the third item home okay. language survey purpose I, I think we kind of wrap around that down here. Yeah. Okay, um, so yes. my, my, what I'm trying to say is that a way to make sure if we're doing it as so, some separate thing that we don't miss them because we have to make sure it, it ha you know, that we So she wants to add there that we gotta make sure make we get sure that. Make okay. sure that even if it's done separately that it doesn't because so often if it's not part of that packet, things get missed. Well, they won't get an SSID number without an ELA status. And so, could we put it on a separate color and write important? <laughs> That's a great idea, a separate color. I mean, just to make that one stand yeah. out if we really, if we really, if it's just getting, so it doesn't get lost in the papers, that's the one that no matter what you're yeah. going to see. That's a good point. Okay. So, this question already came up. What programs and services do we offer in San Bruno Park? And we've gone over the instructional um, plan for English learners, but I just want to make sure that I'm making it as clear as possible because sometimes that long document doesn't make much sense. So, there's three different programs that are offered here in San Bruno at this time, or pathways, so to speak. The newcomer pathways, is for students who have been and who have been in the United States states for less than a year. So it's not our kindergartners unless they just moved here. Mm -hmm. So um, I know there's some misconceptions. Like if a child is new to school, they're not considered a newcomer unless they've just moved to the United States and it's the first time in school in the U.S. Structured English immersion. This is um, our students who are not newcomers and have been um, identified as EL for less than four years. And they receive support in order to access the core instruction. So by that, in order to access language arts, math, science, and social studies. Our long-term English learners, this starts at fifth grade because I know um, Seema? Yes. Had, had talked about that she didn't realize that after like five years, they should have been reclassified by that point. So if a student hasn't been reclassified by fifth grade, they're considered a long-term English learner. And at that point, what we've noticed and what research has noticed is it's really about developing academic language and literacy. It's not necessarily that they can't communicate um, with one another in an informal setting. Not that they can't write informally, it's that academic language. And so our goal for um, a long-term English learner program is that they would have regular check-ins with their teachers and their administrators, their counselors, um, and that they would have some structured language development in developing that academic discourse or academic language. So what does this look like? It looks like really small letters. Um, in TK through 5, it looks a little bit different than it does in 6 through 8. So um, I'm not going to read everything to you guys because that... Well, Quick question. Well, yeah, I was just wondering, on your 30 minutes of daily designated ELD, could we use our new Imagine Learning Adopted program to count to or no, it has to be our pathways and um. well um, imagine learning is a supplemental tool for for helping students access um, English language so it could be part of it but I would okay. say it's the only component well I mean with kindergarten we do so much right I mean right. I feel like I'm teaching ELT anyways right and then 30 minutes of like day day is a lot when I only have one student to dedicate 30 minutes to them right. as opposed to the other. And, that, and, it, and that's one thing that our teachers encounter here is they're not really um, able 
in a traditional sense. There's five different models for an English learner development program in um, a K-8 setting or K-6 setting, depending on what your elementary is. Um, and they look very different. Um, when you only have one or two students, it might become part of your English language arts block where you're meeting with a small group and they're working on similar skills. Because if you think about it, all of our students are learning English for the first time, academic English. They all come to us knowing how, to, uh, whatever they know in terms of speaking English informally, but everyone comes to school needing development in academic language. So for many of our teachers, they can't just, you can't just meet with one kid for 30 minutes and have 24 kindergartners, 28 kindergartners just doing whatever. <laughs> so it becomes where you have to do, and I know all of the teachers here do workshop of some sort or small groups so that they're rotating through and they're seeing each of the kids for a minimum of 30 minutes a day. Does it need to be 30 minutes all at once? No. It could be 15 and 15, 20 and 10, but it needs to be protected time that they have access to every day. Yes, ma'am. Would you add about car site? The car site? And I have another. Okay. <laughs> and so then at, at, the, at the middle school level, every child who is considered an English learner has a designated period for ELB. So, we, this year, we, um, when we approved our English learner plan, we adopted English 3D as the curriculum for our long-term English learners and System 44 and Read 180 for our newer students. Um, our newcomers at the middle school also have access to Rosetta Stone, which I don't know if you've all heard about it, but it's, it has like seven million languages and helps you learn via um, an online Program. It used to be like a bunch of CDs and DVDs. Um, that, that's an excellent program for helping students to access, and, and adults too, to access English or any other program, I mean any other language. Um, one thing that I want to share with you is that next year we're looking at piloting, it's called the Academic Vocabulary Toolkit, and it was um, developed for long-term English learners out of the research done by Dr. Kate That's Kinsella. Right. She's from San Francisco State University. Um, she is considered the guru of English language development. Um, and so that academic vocabulary toolkit really focuses on giving students access to um, content vocabulary and developing their skills for communication. Um, we're looking at piloting it in fifth grade for next, next school year. Worried about time? Right. I am worried about time. Oh. <laughs> because we got started like 20 minutes. I know. We should write it down and then we can share the parking lot. So, so save? Okay. Okay. Um, one question we also get, and this was a big question when I got here, was um, students with IEPs, do they not get ELD? So a student with a disability, like if you are dyslexic or you have an auditory processing or you have speech and language um, support. So students who are <coughs> considered a student with a disability, they do have the opportunity um, to receive ELD services as well. The IEP team, which is general education teacher, educational specialist or the special ed teacher, the principal or another administrator, any other service providers, and most importantly, the parents, and anybody that parent chooses to bring, all work together to develop the IEP. In the IEP, that team determines whether or not that child, um, how the services are offered. If a student does not have any goals related to their language development, then they participate in ELD just like every other student. It wouldn't be a separate special education um, English language development class. If they, if they do identify, hey, they have linguistic goals, this is how we're going to address them, um, like either through like a learning center model or whatnot, that would be decided by the IEP team. The other thing that the IEP team um, 
it decides upon <coughs> is what supports and accommodations that students will receive when they take the LPAC. Like for example, do they need structured breaks? Do they need a smaller group setting? Do they need um, a one, they don't get a one to one last week. I'm just trying to think of what, of what they are, additional time. Those are the kind of things that they might need to be able to, um, to access the test. Students with the most severe disabilities, so our students who are considered intellectually disabled or, um, or cognitively delayed, they might participate in an alternate assessment. Right now, our district has identified Brigance as that alternate assessment, but it must be noted in their IEP. So if they don't have it in their IEP, they take the LPAC. All right, our discussion. Get your moment going. Down discussion. Okay, so. Is Sarah gonna take that time to send this part? Or would you like me to help? What do you mean? On the, the answers to these questions. Do you want her to just take notes there instead of doing this? It's, it's, it's up to the group. I'll take notes up here if you want. Okay. Because I know you're interpreting. Or do you, would you like to do F9 to me? I think, right? Okay. 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 The marker. Fancy pens. Okay. <laughs> so at this time, you know, the, in, if it takes time. Can I the parking lot? Or oh, oh, here's your turn. I just put parking lot back because I. Uh, go this way. Yeah. And then mine up and then you'll have it from the page. Or you might not. Or do you? Yeah. I believe it's the last thing that Okay. We have more right next to us. Okay. So and it might help if you talk with each other. Maybe we should get closer because I think everyone feels so isolated. What questions do you have about the services and programs that are offered? What types of services and programs would you like to see us offer for our children? And then what are some ideas for making our services and programs more clear to parents and guardians? Okay. Do you want to that Ms. Carmen had was that the programs that were um, presented, those are ones that we have now and will have and will continue to have in the future? Yes. So will these continue? So I'm paraphrasing. Yes. So you're asking whether these are programs that we currently have and will continue to have? Yes? Okay. Um, I have a question. Yes. Um, so did the school district or the school site communicate these programs with the parents when they enroll their children? Not necessarily the what different models that they utilize. Oh, that's your question, though, right? <laughs> um, but when once a child's identified as um, as an English learner, an annual letter goes home that says the different ways that we offer um, our English language development courses. Whether that makes it very clear to parents or guardians is another question, and so that's why I want to hear from you guys about how we could make it more clear, because I know that that. That letter is written in alignment with law, and law is often clear as mud. It's not. It's not for the general audience <laughs> to understand. So, do you have some ideas about making that more clear to parents? Uh, probably like <laughs> meetings with the parents who kids are enrolled in the program or assessed as eligible for this program. Okay, so holding a meeting um, mm -hmm. after students become eligible? Yeah. Okay. And we also do that with the ELAC, don't we? Yeah, that's yeah. the ELAC does. We have the does. ELAC meetings and we try to get everyone to come to those meetings. We try to make sure they know ahead of time. Okay. And I have another question. Yes. There is a special uh, program from the district for the exams to see the level for the student that he has second language. I'm sorry, I'm not sure I understand. So I think, what, what is it, how are they communicating the results no, how of the they, exam? Uh, uh, figure out his level. There's a special program for this. Okay, that's a great question. Yeah. So she's asking how we determine the level. We use um, the state adopted language proficiency exam, which is called LPAC. 
Okay. Which stands for English Language Program. No, English Language Proficiency Assessment of California. Oh, okay. So that test has been um, norm referenced, which means that it's compared with results from all over the nation in order to determine the levels. And so they create those levels and then they adjust them after they norm reference them. So when they came out with the LPAC about three or four years ago, they first do like a pilot of it where they, or a field study is the first. So you have a bunch of people take it and you work out the kinks and then you might do another round of field study um, and then you would go through a piloting process where people try it out and they give feedback and then they refine it even further. And so um, kind of like clinical trials in order to make sure that it's a valid assessment. Mm -hmm. So we don't have our own um, at each district. Oh, okay. It's determined by the state. Oh, okay. So the feds tell us that we have to have mm -hmm. one and then each state has their own. And when the parents receive this letter from the district, the teacher or the school receive the same letter to see the child in which level he is? Yes, so the teachers receive um, like a list of their students and what their levels are, and then the teachers also have access to Illuminate, which is um, our student information system, and they're able to see um, what level they are so they can design their instruction. So I agree with her to discuss it with the parent, with the teacher to call the parent and discuss the level with her and how she should the parents or in the school help the student to reach a good level because we don't know, no, but we never uh, right. and what, anybody what explained this level? with us and yeah. I always received this letter on the mail and I never know anything about it. That's a good point. So um, having teachers meet with the parents individually um, to discuss their child's yes. level and what they can do to help support them. Mm -hmm. This can be done also in the conference, uh, parents parent conference. No, but they never mentioned that to me. How, how does oh, it wow. work? Okay. And well, I know I do it with parents when they come for conferences. I'll even bring it up on Illuminate and show them. And um, But it might not be something that our teachers are used to sharing at conferences. Yes, yes. Exactly. So, so if we make a point of... No, they share things. Both the people Good. do. I know. I know Miss Chaucer. Right. Well, and I know it's also doing it. How yeah. much? How, well, it's just also hard. I mean, you are getting in all the conferences. You're trying to get in a lot of information. Yeah. So maybe when we do it, we aren't yes. presenting it with enough information due to the fact that okay, yes, we we want to show you this level, but we want to talk about this. this is, so maybe if. Parents know, in a sense, maybe after the home language survey comes out, class, and then we say your child will be taking a test, mm -hmm. and it will determine X level, X level, X level, and a quick little blurb about it. That way, when a parent comes That's to a it, conference, yeah. mm -hmm. if they have already seen, like, okay, well, my child's at X level, and that means this, then presenting it to us, we can talk a little bit more because you already have your concerns laid out and right. then we can hit on full and not have the conference become an hour long because we have another one kept. Right. So I understand the concerns and maybe we don't address it enough due to the fact that the levels aren't discussed. So then it's now on top of discussing where they are when they took the test, but no wait, we have to go back and discuss what that level means. Right. So I think one thing that can be done is parents should be encouraged to attend the ELAC meetings. There are some amazing videos put out by the state of California about how to understand what that score report means and what parents can do to help them. I'm going to encourage our principals to share those at their ELAC meetings with their parents. And it's just a matter of capturing our parents to come to those meetings. Um, so I know Eddie's been helping us by live streaming some of some of these things and um, just getting our parents connected to that. So maybe the folks that post to their Facebook, maybe posting a link to that, like parents, this is what's coming up in the LPAC video. So even if they can't come, they can understand, you know, what the um, 
what the test is about. Because there are some really good videos that just break it down. There's some handouts too, but you know, sometimes that video just makes it really clear and it talks about those level descriptors in detail. Can we post it on our district site? Yes, that's a great idea. I will post it on the district's website. Thank you. And I mean, most, and, and a lot of that stuff they have English and Spanish. So yeah, they, they do. I, and it's the same thing I forwarded to Nomina, my mm -hmm. presentation, right. that because I had a group and they just all happened to speak Spanish, <coughs> Spanish, we decided let's just watch it in Spanish. Right. So whatever you're, and, and it's in English, so it's in English. And sometimes if you look through the website more, there's, mul there's information in multiple languages. Right. And there's even practice tests on that website as well that parents can go through with their kiddos so that they can, that parents can understand what are we assessing the kids on. And one thing that we realized here in San Bruno, and I know Ms. Dees and I were like, it was a, um, an eye opener for both of us, because our district has very few English learners. Um, we've always utilized retired teachers to come and test. So many of our teachers have never administered the LPAP mm -hmm. or even the SELT in the past. So they're not always familiar with what the test is measuring. Mm -hmm. So this year I know at Bel Air, um, Ms. Dees trained her entire staff on the LPAC so that they know what their kids are being asked to do, um, which is really eye-opening because if you've never seen the test, you don't really know how to prepare the kids to take yes. that test. <laughs> and, the, and the teachers had never administered the test when I talked to them today. They can do it and they want to do it. And we talked about all the reasons why. Unfortunately, it's not possible in K-1, right, especially when there's so many. Yeah. And, but by second grade, you know, they can, mm -hmm. and administering the test is much more advantageous, also when it's given by their own teacher who they've grown to love and respect, mm -hmm. than a stranger. Yeah, <laughs> I know. I've given it in another district um, to middle school and elementary students, but it was the old test. Now we have the new test. Yeah. So yeah. I know when it's I very similar. When I was a program coordinator eons ago, we used to, um, and we realized we used to, because the window used to open for CELT on July first, and we would call kids in during the summer and start testing them because we wanted to get it done. And what we found is, especially for our sixth graders who were coming into the middle school, they didn't they didn't know who the heck I was. And this was their first time setting foot on the middle school campus. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to that one-to-one -one portion where you're trying to get them to speak to you, they don't want, they don't know me. They don't want to talk to me, I'm some random lady. So <laughs> they didn't do as well. So we realized like, okay, back then the window was from July mm -hmm. till November. We pushed our testing back till October so that they knew the people who were giving them the test. So that's that's one of the reasons why the state moved to the LPAC having that summative later on in the year rather than as soon as they walk in the door. And they are also our practice tests for that. Yes. Too. They can help them. Yes. Um, th I had a question about the um, can parents on Parent Portal for Illuminate pull up all of their scores and things yes. like that? Because that will be helpful if you can see if the student with state testing just stays as kind of flat in yeah. their growth, you know that there's an issue where they need to develop academic vocabulary yeah. and those things. So, but sometimes I think parents need help, like through a meeting. What does this mean? You know, we'll so, see it. so that's a good idea. So one idea might be making sure that our parents have access to the portal and that they have like an information session to help them understand what they're seeing mm -hmm. on the portal. Because if you're logging in, you don't know, you know, what you're looking at. Yeah. It doesn't well, make sense. Yeah, that's why I take them to a conference. But I try to conference yeah. with every parent, and I'm still okay. working on it. Every okay. parent. Is yeah. there services that parents would like to see that are currently not offered through our English Learner Program? Yeah. 
I know one thing that's come to me quite a bit is like, are there bilingual or multiple language programs available? And we're in the exploration phase of that. I don't know if that's a desire for parents. Uh, Miss, Miss uh, Carmen was expressing that in an offline comment that there aren't other languages offered at Parkside. Okay. And I said that is offered, that would be offered in, the, in electives. I do offer. You do have world languages. I teach world languages. Well, the also. school offers yeah. world languages. Um, as an, as an online, a, right, and it's an online right. program. Online, online. But I think I think one thing um, that a lot of parents have asked about is like dual immersion programs. Like, we're, is that something that parents are looking for in this district or no? Like another yeah. language to learn? Like yeah, a totally new language. So some schools do like. Locally, we have um, some schools that do like Mandarin immersion, um, where they learn Mandarin as well as English at the same time. Um, there are some schools that do Spanish at the same time, um, which when you have um, a Spanish bilingual program, they like to see it as half of the students. Only half of the students are native Spanish speakers and the other half are English speakers, so that it's not just kids learning their primary language over again, so that we're actually developing um, bilingualism in our students. Is that offered in middle school or high school? It's usually <laughs> elementary. Oh. Yeah. So, but it's not something we offer here. Okay. So is that something parents are interested in seeing? You'd have to have fun here to create a Right, right, no, 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 I know. I know, I'm doing the uh, feasibility study right now. <laughs> um, yeah, for that, we well, need to make a big group so we can okay. get different ideas and see what they need or what they, they yeah. prefer. For so them. maybe um, one suggestion might be like ex giving our GLAC an opportunity to explore what other types of English services are available. Mm -hmm. So one thing um, that Ms. Munoz Carmen expressed is that there's a, you know, they do maybe speak Spanish or something, but they, they don't read or write it, and maybe that would be something that they'd like to see, you know, further enhanced for Spanish, because they come with a really strong foundation, right? At, you know, Spanish for Spanish speakers, like they have often in high schools. Right, but so, so um, offering programs that emphasize learning in their home language, mm -hmm. is that my interpretation? Yeah. All right. Would that be something we could do, per se, as like an after school? It's worse than it's That uh, it wouldn't meet the ELD requirements, but it could be like um, an enrichment opportunity. Uh -huh. um, one of the things that we've encountered, not just in San Bruno, but all over California, is folks having the appropriate credentials mm -hmm. to teach foreign languages. It's really hard to find foreign language yeah. teachers. And that's offline, that's what we were talking about, that it's, it is challenging to find, even in California, right. excellent Spanish teachers. Right. <laughs> and so, like, I know. In third grade, it would be kind of a perfect, just the kinder to third, maybe. Yeah. And so when, when you do roll out like a dual language program, you don't start with like yeah, the whole so school. Yeah, it does come down to a lot of exploration in terms of how feasible it is. Right now, I've started a feasibility study at the request of one of our board members. Um, and what I found is that there, um, we have two folks employed in the district who have bilingual credentials, and that is Ms. Dees. <laughs> and one teacher at Bel Air. Uh -huh. So it would be quite challenging because that would mean either eliminating some teachers who didn't have the appropriate credential to open the school or hiring um, more teachers that would take their place, which is not a popular idea. Right. You know. Or, I mean, we have what she was saying, well, Ms. Menendez speaks Spanish, but she doesn't have that credential. So or offering incentives for teachers to go, teachers to to go and get their B-clad. Miss Zubert speaks Spanish. She might not have a credential, but she could get a 
you know, there's there's a few out there that probably speak Spanish. Right, there but are. Don't have the credential, mm -hmm. and we do have other teachers who speak other, other languages. languages. Mm -hmm. We have teachers who speak Mandarin, and we have teachers who speak Vietnamese, but they may not have pursued that bilingual credential because mm -hmm. it's more, it's a lot more work. Yeah. And just to add in with the world languages class, students have Latin, French, German, Chinese, and um, Spanish, and most of them are taking Spanish, but. My point is that and with that, there is a California certified teacher in that language who is checking their work, doing, you know, right. and uh, communication, and then I mentor all of those languages in the class. So they're getting a quality, I mean, it's right. online like you would with something else. So it does give them something, right. which I celebrate because in the room, I mean, so exciting. Right, and, exciting. and as we move further along in the 21st century, the way we do business, the way we go to school has become different. So online programs, I mean, my when I did my doctorate, it was 60% online and 40% in person. And that's a lot of our kids and our families, that's how they're learning. Mm -hmm. um, I remember a time last year where I had never used Google Hangout. <laughs> and now I have multiple meetings per day via Google Hangout, which is like, it, it's like FaceTime. Skyping or FaceTime. I'm writing like, that down. <laughs> and, um, and, you know, and that was something I had never done until I moved to the Bay Area. Like, we had these crazy Cisco rooms where we could do group meetings and they never worked. Like, we were innovative <laughs> like 10 years ago. But it, this has become the way we do business. So, having an online program is not something that's absurd. Right. The only thing with that is. I don't want to have us say let's rely on our online because we don't have one-to-one -one for kids and right. it is a struggle trying to share devices. devices. And yeah. so that's the only thing. Yes, it's great, but I don't want to sit here and say right. that is our end-all be-all until right. our district can do one-to-one -one with kids and right. we're not there. So that would be more of an enrichment elective option, not how we provide EL services. And we okay. have I'm speak. Park side. I would, yeah. I'm going to speed us up just a little bit because I want to make sure I get through every classification. Okay, so this has become a hot topic recently. Um, not the store at the mall. Reclassification. Reclassification. Um, many of our parents, when students are in TK through grade five, they're getting that 30 minutes during their day. And it's not necessarily like a period where they go to a separate class or anything. And so a lot of times when kiddos get to sixth grade, that's the first time that parents really realize that their child is have, has ELD. <coughs> so a lot of times parents aren't involved in that conversation about how can I support my student to become reclassified. So we wanna make sure that we're communicating that reclassification process to all of our families. Um, and that's where I rely on you guys to bring this back to your ELAC. Um, reclassification in the state of California requires four minimum requirements. There are some districts that require more requirements um, than this. And I know prior in prior years, San Bruno required more than the minimum requirements. Um, the four major requirements are achievement on a state test, teacher recommendation, parent consultation, and the administrator's recommendation. So the state test for here is the SBAC. Oh my gosh, did I actually leave off the LCAP? I'm gonna fix something as we're talking. No, uh, I can't. I no, we can write it in on ours. <laughs> So in addition, so in addition to being a four on the L pad, oh my gosh, I can't, how did I do that? You guys have the right to publicly flog me. Well, it's, it's on here. It's right. on the okay. form. Uh-huh. Okay. It's okay. And I'm sorry. It. No, it's fine. Is, is, yeah. Which is so missing. students have to, first off, have a four on the LPAC. Well, I think the LPAC is in the center. Isn't that when they take I, it says on LPAC? Four I on LPAC. Just wrote that. 
Oh, you did? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's on this, it's printed. Okay. <laughs> so okay. students have, that's the yeah, first that's requisite. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> and then there are four more components. So they must have a four on the LCAP. A four means that they are well developed. And then they have these other four criteria. So the SBAC is our state, um, it's the standards-based assessment. And that, the SBAC, a level three means that they're at grade level. A level four means they're exceeding grade level. So as long as they're scoring at or above grade level on that assessment, mm -hmm. as well as scoring a four on the, on the LCAC, mm -hmm. in addition, the teacher needs to recommend that it's time for reclassification. If they're failing their classes, their teacher's probably not going to <laughs> recommend that. And the teacher's asked to comment on four different areas. They're speaking, they're listening, they're writing, and they're reading. Because it's our obligation before we reclassify a student to provide them support. And if the teacher sees that they're still struggling, maybe in writing or in reading, then they come up with a plan. And then you guys, you guys have the form in front of you, right? Mm -hmm. yes. So this is what the form looks like. Um, when a child is considered for reclassification, you'll meet with um, the principal most likely. At the middle school, it might be the assistant principal. Um, and you'll have a conversation about whether they qualify. The parent, maybe if you can't come in, you could do it over the phone. You could provide a letter. Um, they just need a confirmation from you that you're okay with them not having those services. So, they would go through this form basically. Did they do well in the LPAC? Did they do well in the state test? The other qualification this year, this is the first year we've had the REN star. If students do well in the REN star, then they can be considered in the middle of the year for reclassification. So we don't have to wait for the state test. And teacher, we already talked about teacher recommendation, parent consultation. Ultimately, the principal has to sign off on this document in order for it to be approved. It's then entered into the system, and they never have to take the LPAC again. So when he reaches the level four, he's not gonna take any test. He yes. has to meet but all all five of these criteria. Oh, oh, okay. All five. Mm -hmm. So after they become reclassified, the district is obligated to monitor them for two years oh. afterward. So if they see that they're slipping, we must provide them support. So it might look like an ELD class, it might be a Read 180, it might be just small group instruction. But it's our obligation to make sure that your child isn't struggling after they've become reclassified because we don't want to send them out there to the wolves without the skills they need to be successful. So they have to meet all five criteria before, and this is one thing that um, the state is been, has been discussing, because what's assessed on the SBAC is not exactly what's assessed on the language proficiency exam. So they've just been discussing removing that criteria about the SBAC. Oh, and good. to be honest, that is the biggest area that prevents our students from becoming reclassified is that they don't do well in the state assessment. Yes. Um, so I am all for that. Okay, it's just that it's S back in English and Arabic. Nope, it's English language arts. Only? Only. Some districts may have, um, may have the requirement of math, but it's only English language arts that's required. Okay. That's the form. Discussion. <laughs> so I know we only have two minutes left, and I totally respect you if you have to pack up and leave. But I would love it if you stay a few more minutes to give us some insight around making this process more clear for parents. Um, so is there anybody who just must go right this moment? We're taking the time to care about my child. And, you know, right. it's great. It's and even as, as bad as my Spanish is, and <laughs> whenever I try and speak to parents in Spanish, I feel like they appreciate that. So any effort <laughs> that you make above and beyond, I know um, that folks really appreciate you being concerned about their child and, 
and trying to help and trying to communicate with them. Are there other ideas that we have for how families could support the RFEP process? I know you offered one like that. If you see their child, if your child's ready. Um, and, and middle school, I like to have the students even at conferences translate. They come, they translate for their parent what I'm saying. So ways to get the students, get especially the students older involved. students, involved. I forgot to write down goal setting and getting yeah. student involved. My writing is not as nice as everybody else. No, it looks great. We, we can read it. It's good. <laughs> yeah, and I know as a prior middle school teacher and program coordinator, I, when I met, I met with each of the kids who had um, ELD, in addition to a bunch of other kids for different reasons, but I met with them individually and I looked at their scores with them, and that made a huge impact for them. Because a lot of kiddos were like, wait, I don't have to take ELD if I just do better on my benchmark assessment? I don't even take that thing seriously. You know? <laughs> so a lot of times, Especially with middle schoolers that they don't realize implications and I know I don't have a slide for this because this is my final slide before we do just announcements and adjournment but I really do want to have an open and candid conversation with families um, next time about what the consequences are about not being reclassified when you get to high school um, one thing I'll just give you a few um, I was a high school assistant principal, and I've done a lot at the district level with um, English learners. And one thing that I've seen as a, as a prior high school administrator and teacher is that our kiddos who don't get reclassified by high school, well, number one, they're more likely to drop out of high school, okay? Because they're taking remediated classes, and for some kids, that hurts their self-esteem, as well as it <laughs> so they don't enjoy going to school. So a lot of times we see that they drop out more frequently. The other thing, and this is more important, is that they don't have access to all the electives that they could have. Because they're taking ELD and they're not able to take a foreign language or they're not able to take art or music or dance. So the, it becomes where it narrows them. This is the most important thing that I've yes. seen. This next one is that when a student goes into high school and they are still considered an English learner, they are enrolled in a what's called a sheltered um, instruction course. Sheltered instruction is when a student requires support in English. Um, so it's like a supportive class. There's often like an instructional aid in the classroom. And it's usually for science and for social studies. Sometimes you have language arts and math that are sheltered. Sheltered sections of, of any class are not considered college prep. In order to meet the requirements to enter into a four-year university, you have to have passed college prep class. I saw some of the most amazing kiddos have to go to community college. There's nothing wrong with community college, but they could not go straight to a four-year university because they didn't have four years of college preparatory language arts <coughs> English. They had sheltered instruction. I don't want to see that happen to any kid. And I could tell you, I, I had this young man, he was, he was a dream act, he was a dreamer, and he was so excited and he was doing his applications and he met all, this kid was amazing. And he could not go to a UC school and just to, get goosebumps, just to see like how crushed he was because he couldn't go directly. He was able to get financial aid because he was part of Dream Act, but because his classes were sheltered instruction, they didn't qualify towards those A through G requirements. So, that is one reason why we gotta encourage our kiddos to get reclassified before they get to high school. And even at middle school, they, they don't have as many options in terms of electives. But it really starts to count once they get to high school because 
they have the sheltered sections or they're not able to take their two years of foreign language or their additional year of science or additional year of math, those kind of things that are required for universities. So I know that's not in my slideshow, but that I just really want to oh, emphasize. good to know. Well, Thank you. That's what, uh, what our first yeah. elect meeting was about for parents. And then I'm still trying to, I want to make sure every parent knows. So I'm still trying to meet with parents. With it. Right. You know, and so, and, and that's, that's what's really important about this committee is that reaching out to the other parents at your school and getting them involved and getting them to understand these things because there's a set of things that we go over at ELAC every year. We go over at DLAC every year. And this is one of them. And if parents aren't able to attend those, making sure they get the information somehow because we want to have informed parents. We want parents involved. You are your child's first teacher, so we, we need you. And, and we want you to understand the system so that you're able to navigate. If you, if you don't know where you're headed, <laughs> then your life will get lost. You know, um, I don't get in my car without turning on the GPS. Mm -hmm. well, except Sometimes when I'm going when home. The <laughs> language at home is a foreign language. They aren't comfortable coming. And so I have to really, I mean, I make a sincere effort constantly. And I go down my list, you know, to get them to feel comfortable and please come. And honestly, I, I know I'm not supposed to speak to the audience, but <laughs> I really appreciate that Eddie comes to these and live streams these meetings because some parents are not comfortable coming. Um, so if we're able to do that at the school sites even, to live stream like your ELAC meetings and put them on your website, or not live, not necessarily live stream, but stream, <laughs> but videotape them, that's an excellent way. Yeah, that's an excellent way to reach families. Right, put it in that extra video. Please. Mm -hmm. You know, and also, before we leave, may I plug? One thing that's really encouraging, so I was talking to Carmen, and I'm trying to work on Bel Air, because that's my school, but ask your parents a great opportunity if they don't want to come to our meeting, but to give input to our district and improving things, is to fill out the parent survey that has been sent yes. home. Yeah. It was given via email, and if you don't have access to that, the office managers or parent liaisons or principals can help you with that. So make sure all your friends are taking the survey as well, because I just asked Carmen that because I looked through it. So um, I know it's hard to get to movies, to, to meetings, but this and is an movies easy, and movies, but it's 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 easy check off. We did it at a PTA meeting, or, you know. So how many of you guys have completed that already? Yes, me. That's it. That's it. Very good. Sure, sure. Yeah. Okay. So make sure that you complete that survey. And then your school site, if you don't have computer access, they have Chromebooks available for you to take it right there. They have paper copies. Make sure you're taking that survey. Thank you for plugging that in. I appreciate that. So um, we're at section eight, the announcements. And the LCAP survey is open until the 21st, right, or 24? 24. 24. Yes, that's 24. So make sure you take that, take it for each kid that you have in school, okay? Um, so if you have kids at Bel Air and you have kids at Parkside, make sure you take it for, for both schools because it gives us feedback about the schools as well. Um, that will be open through the 24th. Our next DLAC meeting is in March. At that meeting, we're going to be looking at our consolidated application, which is called the CONAP. It's how we apply for money and getting a little bit more feedback from you guys for our LCAP. Please tell your friends to come. I'm excited to see that we have guests, but please, please make sure that you're telling it's your It's open friends. for the theater? It's open to the public, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. I have, I have a um, announcement. Only, only, um, only voting members can vote, but um, oh, okay. it's open to the public. Oh, open. Yeah. My announcement is just I'm doing university research in one of my English learner classes that is, um, is supporting them in engagement, reducing stress, and academic growth across three weeks. So it's exciting. Yeah. Cool. All right. We're going to um, revisit the parking lot. We don't have anything in the parking lot, so if we can make a motion to adjourn the meeting. I think Ms. Munoz, did you want to make a motion to adjourn? Yes, Ms. Munoz. <laughs> She's really She'd like to make a motion to adjourn. Her translator spoke for her. Um, is there anyone who'd like to make, would you like to make a second?
Yes, tell me your last name. Kaylin. K A L E H. K L. K A. K A. L E H. L E H. Kaylin. Kaylin. Okay, so motion. The second is the motion. Okay. So it is 719. All those in favor of adjourning the meetings? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Silence is consent. All right. Thank you guys so much, and thank you for staying late. No, thanks for your time.